our homes, with our children, with our young people around issues of same-sex relationships. Bill has um, done an amazing amount of work in listening to first century voices and their take on relationships and sexuality in general. And that informs then how we come to the biblical texts and work with them as part of our faith tradition. Um, I have a lot of respect for Bill and I think a lot of people do. Whether he welcomes it or not, it's there. Um, but I think the other thing that Bill brings is a sense of down-to-earthness in this conversation and a capacity to be able to listen to each other as we have this dialogue. So I'm going to hand over to Bill. Um, if people are wanting a smaller group to work with, I'm going to be out in the meeting room. I'll just stand by the door for a minute or two um, and see where we go from there. But yes, thank you, Bill. Well, thank you uh, for the introduction, and it's good to be able to be with you. I, I think that lay preachers are more important than they have ever been in the life of the church, um, and that that importance is going to increase as time goes by, particularly in, well, not only in rural areas, but in metropolitan areas. I think the pattern is probably going to be that in many areas of the church's life you will have ministers of the word or deacons um, doing a kind of um, regional ministry where congregations, and there can be a number of them, will be looked after and uh, the preaching and the worship leading will be done by people who are local. Um, some of you have a Methodist background. Uh, I do, way back in uh, New Zealand in the 1960s, I became a lay preacher, the beginning of the 60s, I think 1961. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, things that we used to call lay preachers in the Methodist church um, was local preachers, because way back at the beginning, um, you would have uh, circuit riders, so your ministers would go out on horseback and they would visit congregations, but the church's life depended, depended on having local preachers who not only preached but led worship. And that's where, in the Methodist tradition, that's where local preachers came from. When we got lots of ministers, then, well, local preachers became lay preachers, they were people who would fill in from time to time. You know, the minister's sick or something, and um, there's a reason why, oh, let's call a lay preacher if there's not a retired minister. Um, but what will happen in the future, I think, is that we're more and more, we're going to see the church um, congregations led by teams of people who are both preachers and liturgists, people who have been trained to lead worship. And... Uh, the survival of the church, the future of the church, is very much tied up with people exercising that kind of leadership. So that's, I'm not trying to butter you up. I, I genuinely believe that lay preachers are more important now and will be even more important in the future than they have been in the past. That's got nothing to do with same-sex relations. Unless you can make some sort of link, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the issue of same-sex relations is an area of controversy um, in the church. Um, it's probably not as hot as it used to be, but uh, it has been an area where, for some people, um, it's almost become the issue on which you are judged as being a true believer or not, from both sides. Um, so there have been, there's been a lot of hurt and pain from both sides. If there are two sides, there's probably more than two sides to the debate. Um, and uh, so there have been these non-rational factors that have really clouded the issue a lot as well. In the late 90s, um, early 2000s, the noughties, as they've come to be called, which I think is a very strange way, 90s is okay, but noughties, 
um, the 2000s. Um, I, I sense that one of the things that the church, the churches across the world really needed was more research on uh, what people in the ancient world, including the writers of scripture, actually understood and meant when they talked about sex and when they talked about same-sex relations. So I embarked on research that, um, I mean, out of that have come seven books, um, and I was able to get a Australian Research Council government grant to work for five years intensively on issues of sexuality in early Judaism and, uh, and in Christia Christianity up to the end of the first century. Um, that was 2005 to 2010. And my aim in that has been to enable people to hear what was being said in its context. Uh, in a sense, engaging with scripture is a cross-cultural encounter. So you need to hear, they spoke a different language for a start. You need to hear them in their language, in their culture, in their background. And you need to hear them whether you like what you hear or not. Now before I go on, let me say, because some of you may come from a strong perspective on this side or that side, um, I gave this presentation, at least uh, basically this presentation, I always revise things and try to improve uh, myself and what I do as I go on, um, but I gave this presentation to the um, National Conference of Anglican Bishops here in Western Australia. I mean, just a, it's not very different from the National Conference of Uniting Church Lay Preachers. Um, it's comparable, I think. Um, and uh, it was very interesting, the Archbishop of Sydney, Peter Jensen, some of you will know, uh, who's known by some as an arch-conservative, came up to me afterwards and said that's the best presentation of the issues he's ever heard. Uh, talking about the historical presentation. I say that so that if you if you come from a more conservative point of view, um, know that the kind of research that I've done um, is widely accepted on both the conservative and the whatever you call the other end um, and across the board. Of course, in historical issues, there will be disagreements on some things. Um, but at least for the listening to the voices, um, we should see this as a thing in which we can have common ground. Uh, the, uh, our perspectives will differ with the question, so what do we do with this? You know, do, do we take over first century perspectives? Um, when we engage scripture, do we, do we try to uphold it? Do we move away from it? And there, there will be different points of view. And what I will do in the second part of my presentation is I'll outline basically three approaches there are more than that, but um, putting them under three headings uh, approaches that people can take. So let's begin with uh, some uh, principles, really. Um, first of all, an outline of what I'm going to do um, in asking the question, what were they saying then? I'm going to look first of all at the author Philo, who lived about the time of Jesus and just a bit after. He lived in Egypt, actually. He was a Jew. Um, his writings uh, go about that long along my shelf, and if I divided the New Testament up, that would come, you know, the Bible wouldn't even go along that far. In other words, we've got voluminous, we've got a lot of writings from Philo of Alexandria, and uh, while he's got distinctive elements to his thinking, in many ways he reflects the common Jewish understanding of same-sex relations. And so it's really helpful to have him uh, because he also tells us why they had these approaches. I will then look at other Jewish writings. I'll then look at the New Testament um, and in particular look at the only passage really which is, uh, uh, addresses uh, the issue of same-sex relations, namely Paul's uh, letter to the Romans where it's in four or five verses there, and we'll look at those in some detail. So that's what we're going to do. And then in the second part, we'll look at uh, what are we to say today. Can I say if there is any point where, uh, where it's not clear um, what I'm saying or you've got questions, I'm going to stop every now and again anyway, um, because it is, after all, Saturday afternoon. 
and and to sit through a whole presentation without a break is a bit cruel. Um, so feel free to stop at any point and, and raise questions. I will stop from time to time and so you've got time to talk with people around you on your table. I've introduced um, some hermeneutical presuppositions, that's to say presuppositions that inform my interpretation, how I'm approaching things. So I need to listen to others to what they are saying in their terms, in their language, in their context. I've already outlined that. That's terribly important in all relationships. I need to avoid selective hearing of only what I want to hear or reading in my preferred views. We've all had the experience of people who have listened to us and heard only what they wanted to hear. Um, that happens in human relations. It also happens when people approach scripture. Sometimes they know what they want to hear and that's what they hear and so they don't hear other things that are being said. We need to be aware that, uh, well I've said it in personal terms, that I will have blind spots and so I need to engage with others in reading these texts. Um, I might try to be as objective as I possibly can be, um, but I'm fallible and all scholars are fallible and all people are fallible. And this is why when we do this kind of research, we do it in dialogue with other researchers. Um, like there's an academic discipline in that, but it's also at the very practical level that we are fallible human beings and we need to listen together um, to what other people are saying so we don't miss things. Um, we need to respect the text and its authors, not least because we're dealing with a revered text of scripture. Um, the Uniting Church in its Basis of Union talks about the scriptures as a witness to the word. Uh, this is the body of material that we have in the Bible through which God speaks to us. Um, these are sacred texts for us. They're not infallible texts, but they are texts that are a witness. And so we approach them with reverence. Um, openness to engage others with integrity and to take responsibility for how we respond uh, needs to be the basis of all relationships, not least our relationship with God. So what I'm saying there is the way we approach these texts actually needs to be consistent with. It all belongs to uh, a way of relating to others, including relating to God, which says, I want to be open to what is there, whether I like it or not whether it fits in with what I like or whether it challenges me and upsets me, that's how I need to relate to other people. I need to treat others as holy, as different from me. I need to respect their otherness. And of course, supremely, we do that in worship. We, we, we open ourselves to God, who is God. We let God be God for us. Um, and we then reflect on the consequences of that, how it might change us. Okay, let's go to Philo, who's mid-first century CE. And uh, I'm going to quote some parts from his writing. I hope at the back you can read th that adequately. Um, it's probably only just legible, but I will read it for you anyway. This is in one of his, uh, one of his books. He writes about um, uh, feasts, parties that uh, used to take place. And he says, For waiting there are slaves of the utmost comeliness and beauty, giving the idea that they have come not so much to render service as to give pleasure to the eyes of the beholders by appearing on the scene. He's talking about um, same-sex behavior that's going to follow. Um, so it happened in the context of parties that you would have people turn up like that goes on to say, who are still boys, and others are full-grown lads, fresh from the bath and smooth-shaven, with their faces smeared with cosmetics and paint, under the eyelids, and the hair of their head prettily plaited and tightly bound. Um, so it's kind of drag queen stuff. Um, but this was happening in the ancient world, and, and uh, he describes this kind of thing at parties and other passages. In the background are others, grown lads, newly bearded, with the down just blooming on their cheeks, recently pets of the pederasts, elaborately dressed up for the heavier services, a proof of the opulence of the hosts 
as those who employ them know, but in reality of their bad taste. So Philo is describing a common situation where same-sex behavior happened in the ancient world that he knew of, and it was in the context of parties uh, where you had slaves, often not necessarily always slaves, um, there to be engaged in by those who have the money um, or those who have the control uh, for sexual purposes. He goes on to describe the gluttony and drunkenness typical of such occasions and the sexual promiscuity which ensues. And this would be um, uh, in such parties, uh, the men, when they were drunk, uh, would be promiscuous with both women and men. So it's quite common for, for the sexual exploitation, as we would describe it, um, for this kind of behavior to go on in these parties, not only just with men, but also with women. So um, this was quite common um, as a pattern. Elsewhere, he describes the men at such parties as typically engaging, as I've just said, in indiscriminate sex with women and men or boys. And, and he describes the incident at Sodom that we hear about in Genesis similarly. Um, the, that Sodom, of course, was an example of um, an attempt to rape the male angels who came. Um, and instead, uh, Lot gives his daughters to be raped, uh, which is a terrible story, actually. Um, but uh, the men of Sodom, when Philo describes them, he said they were mounting uh, other males, but they were also mounting other people's wives. So that, that's quite typical uh, of that sort of behavior. So very briefly, Philo was really saying that same-sex acts happen primarily in wild drunken parties. It's not the whole story. But certainly that's one of the instances, one of the areas where he identifies it. They're simply part of promiscuous, of a promiscuous sexual response. The same men also engage in adultery. The passive partners are frequently slaves exploited for the purpose, made to look like women, functioning in many instances as male prostitutes and ranging in age from puberty to maturity. That's not the whole story. There are other people engaged in these relationships who were not um, slaves, uh, especially older people, um, that these relationships developed and were known. Now, Philo, in this, in this particular book where he, which I've been quoting from, he goes on to, to quote the myth of Aristophanes, um, which is in one of Plato's works. Um, it's a very interesting myth. It's one that Plato doesn't buy, but uh, Plato kind of writes plays where there are dialogues. And so one of the characters who is Aristophanes, there was an Aristophanes who was a playwright. He was a comedy writer, um, but he puts um, this particular view in the mouth of Aristophanes. The myth is an etiology, that's to say an explanation of how things come to be the way they are, an etiology of sexuality according to which humans once existed as male, female and androgynous, that's to say having both a male set of genitalia and a female set of genitalia. Zeus got mad with them because uh, they were insolent and so he cut each of them in half and uh, according to Aristophanes' myth ever since the halves have been trying to find each other. Um, so those deriving from the androgynous beings seeking their opposite, so the male seeking the female, um, and females seeking males, and the other two producing the phenomenon of males seeking males as their other half, and females seeking females as their other half. Uh, this is a, you know, a quirky uh, justification. Uh, of how it comes to be that uh, you've got people uh, of the same sex seeking people of the same sex. Now Philo, um, his response to this is to say, well, it's seductive enough, calculated by the novelty of the notion to beguile the ear, but it's to be treated by the disciples of Moses, that's to say any good Jew, trained from their earliest years to love the truth with supreme contempt. 
Philo rejects the notion that there are people who are naturally gay, um, that are same sex. Like he just rejects that altogether. Um, there are only male and female. Uh, Genesis 1 to 2 sort of tells him that God made male and female, and this was fundamental to um, a Jew's understanding in the time of Jesus. Um, so there are not um, Adam and Steve, there's only Adam and Eve. Um, so, uh, it, well, the High Court has just said there are three, uh, male and female and other, but not according to Genesis and not according to the reading of Genesis at this time by Philo and other Jews, including Christians, male and female, he created them. So this is quite fundamental. That's why they reject these Greek ideas that some Greeks had that it was somehow natural. And what's more, Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13 uh, state the prohibition clearly, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. So, so Leviticus 18 and 20 are really quite clear. And for Jews, the combination of knowing that God has made only male and female and that there is a prohibition um, helps them to hold out against some of the ideas that were around in the world at the time that things might be different. So... Uh, Philo knows, knows the theories that there may be people who are naturally gay, male or female, but rejects the natural homosexuality argument, and this is uh, the common Jewish point of view uh, of the time. Uh, Philo also talks about this and, and explains, gives some more reasons why. Um, he talks about um, uh, men who have been acting the female role, the passive role, uh, allowing themselves to be penetrated, say, through anal intercourse. Um, they, are, they are likely to become more feminine. And he describes that as the female disease. So we're not going to buy all these arguments, but um, you need to understand these were other arguments that were kicking around. Um, and to become, for a male to become like a woman is a step down in the hierarchy of values. Men are more valuable than women, so a man should not uh, let himself to be, be treated like a woman. And uh, Philo talks about the female disease. Um, there's also a belief that he puts forward that um, um, if you engage in same-sex relations, you will develop impotence. Uh, there's also the argument that you will waste semen. Um, there's only a certain amount of semen that men have got, according to the understanding of the ancient world. And if you masturbate or if you waste semen with your wife when she can't get pregnant or if you spend your semen in some other relationships, including a same-sex relationship, you are in danger of wasting semen and not being able to reproduce the species and be fruitful and multiply is also part of Genesis. Now, we, we smile at this because we know that there's, a, there's actually hundreds of thousands of little fish in male sperm uh, and there's not actually a shortage, but we need to understand they believe there was. And so you get some writers talking about depopulation. Philo does this. Um, if, you have, if you allow people to engage in same-sex relations, um, you're going to have a drop in your population because there aren't going to be babies born. Um, they were worried about that. Um, they re were seriously worried about that. Um, and also, if men do this, they lose their virility, their maleness. They become weaklings. And uh, in the ancient world, particularly the Roman um, ideal of the male, um, virility, the V-I-R in the virility is the Roman word for, for male. Um, 
uh, virility you see is about maleness, it's about being strong, it's about being like a soldier. And if you engage either actively or passively in same-sex relations, you are going to become a softy. You're going to undermine your virility. Um, and of course, uh, for Romans, in Roman law, um, same-sex relations with male citizens was illegal. So it was forbidden. It was okay with people who are lesser beings, like uh, foreigners or slaves, but uh, it was forbidden as stuprum, which is a technical term for a criminal, uh, a criminal um, uh, action. Um, the Romans were interesting because they said that uh, engaging in same-sex relations was a Greek disease. Uh, well, see, the argument there is that um, uh, the Greeks did this, uh, and indeed, um, in the aristocracy in in Athens, they did have uh, they did have boys just to, just when they're starting to look a bit feminine and they haven't quite grown their beards. At that point, they many people found them very attractive, almost feminine, and that would be where. Um, the, the sexual behavior of a male uh, adult with a male young boy, adolescent boy, would occur. And there were some who said this was an okay thing. There were others like, like Plato who said it's absolutely not okay. But there was debate about this. And in um, Sparta, one of the Greek states, uh, in fact, it was almost institutionalized uh, as a form of mentoring that a male uh, adult would mentor a, uh, a boy. And frequently that mentoring would have intellectual, exercise, military, but would also have intimacy and sexual, a sexual component to it. So that was a norm that was kicking around. And uh, uh, that's why the Romans called it a Greek disease. Um, it's interesting that where, where that occurred in Greek culture, it was only up to the stage where the man could be married. Like normally people got men married around about the age of 30. And then after that, it was not okay. So it was something you did, you engaged in uh, as a passive partner uh, in the years before you got married. Um, and the Romans, of course, uh, said, well, this is a, a Greek um, disease. The Greek reaction to this is quite interesting because the Romans didn't observe that. They they kept they they said, "Oh, it's okay to have sexual relations with another male, provided it's not a citizen. Um, a foreigner will do, uh, a slave will do, lesser beings, um, and they don't have to be below the age of marriage." So you, it's got a, there's a very interesting little debate that goes on between Greeks and Romans on that. Um, they're both accusing each other of inappropriate behaviour. Um, it was frequently the product of excess um, with alcohol, and Philo makes that point a number of times that um, uh, men lose control and lose their rationality, and that's part of why they engage in that kind of relationship in parties, as we've seen. Um, he makes the point that it's subverting the order of nature. That's another way of saying what I said before. It's contrary to the way God made things. Like uh, God made male and female, so it's unnatural to engage in that kind of behavior. Um, and uh, he, like Plato, argues that animals don't even engage in same-sex relations. Um, and that's an interesting one because we actually know that in the mammal kingdom it's quite common. Um, but how are they to know that? You know, let's not blame them for that. Um, he was also against same-sex relations among women. And most, though Leviticus doesn't talk about lesbian relations, most Jews reading that text uh, said, of course, this applies not only to men, but applies to women. So uh, it's unacceptable behavior. It's to be rejected. Um, so this is Philo's, these are Philo's arguments. Um, and we'll go on to talk about other Jewish writings in a moment who really say similar things. But let me stop and ask if there are any questions about any of that.
about Philo's point of view. All right, next time there's no questions, I'm going to stop and get you to talk to each other. Yes. Yeah, how, how can we know that Philo was representative of Jews of the time? Partly by reading what the others say. Um, yeah, um, and uh, the, the, the fundamental, the core argument uh, is clearly there in the others as well. Um, and the core, the core argument is that there's a prohibition in Scripture and that God made male and female. You won't find all of Philo's arguments, like the semen argument and uh, some of those, um, in the other writers, but you will generally find a lot of the other arguments. Um, and they get reflected, of course, in Paul. Paul shares the same point of view. Um, procreation, that's to say, uh, um, multiplying, uh, keeping the species going, was a major argument, particularly uh, Philo has that, but particularly Plato, um, that sexual intercourse really, its primary purpose is to reproduce. And so semen really shouldn't be used for other purposes. Um, yep. Uh, the, the mentors would be old. The whole thing is going on for all ages, isn't it? I mean, you see something about stopping at the age of 30. Yeah, the passive thing stops at the age of 30. Um, but the action is finished. The action is on all their life. I mean, it's just about to lose those ones. They're well, not being passive today, they're not passive tomorrow. Yeah, well, frequently what would happen is that it, you know, for them, you see, in the, in the Greek culture, in the ancient world, the, the norm was that, um, yes, you would have this mentoring relationship which would involve sexual behaviour, and then it was kind of a rule. You stop when the man gets married, the, 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 the passive partner gets married. A and uh, it was seen as a shameful thing to try to continue the relationship after that. He can find somebody else. Yes, that's right. A absolutely right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, this would happen. You, you know, it just, in Sparta in particular, this was the pattern. This was, the, yeah. This is the way it went. Um, yeah. Yep. He was highly regarded. He was among the elite. He was highly educated. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, he, he wrote so much, so he was highly educated. He was, yeah. Um, it's one with one. Hmm. But that's only one form of this kind of relationship. Um, there were other forms where it was with slaves, where it wasn't about mentoring. But in, the, in terms of what went on in Sparta and in the early days in Athens, that's what went on. In, by the time of New Testament period, it's not actually strong. You've more got uh, same-sex relations through parties, and um, uh, it's not so much the mentoring thing then. So, so there's a bit of a change over the centuries. Yep. Um, it, it wasn't um, kept behind closed doors. It was seen as something that um, um, you, you could engage in. Um, what was totally unacceptable in the Roman context is that you engaged with another Roman citizen. 
Antony and Cleopatra. Yeah, okay. Antoninus. Uh, I don't know the the detail of that. It is quite possibly it it shouldn't be happening between citizens. Yeah. Antony and Cleopatra. I thought you were referring to that. Antony. See, Antony is interesting. You know, Antony and Cleopatra. Those were two lovers. But Antony also um, happened to uh, uh, find out that Herod the Great. You know, Herod the Great of the birth stories in Matthew's Gospel. Herod the Great's wife, Mariamma, was very attractive, and so was her brother. And so he tried to get both of them to come to Egypt so he could have sex with them, with both of them. That's kind of typical, yeah. The Herod found a good way of getting, of blocking that by appointing uh, his um, uh, brother-in-law, um, as uh, the high priest, and the high priest not allowed to leave the land, so he protect. Uh, and uh, Antony backed off because it's really rather crude to uh, try to have sex with your, you know, with Herod the Great's wife. That was just pushing it a bit far. Another question we had somewhere over here. Yes. Yeah, um, we're talking about something that with boys, and it's primarily with boys, it's male. Um, we don't hear much about the female stuff, though it's connected with Sappho on the island of Lesbos. That's where you get lesbian from. Um, uh, so you're talking about children, really. Um, as I said before, um, they thought... Even Philo and Josephus say that a boy at that age is very attractive sexually. I mean, I, I don't quite connect to that, but some people do. Um, and so that's when it really starts. It's not, they don't start at 30, that's when it stops. Yeah, for some parents they would see this as a good way ahead. Um, others would resist it. Like in the Greek and the Roman world, there was, um, you know, this was controversial. It was totally rejected in the Jewish world. Let's go on to the other Jewish authors, and then we'll have a bit of a break on that. Um, like idolatry, same-sex relations were seen as evils typical of pagan society. One of the ways, see, Jews did you know, what some saw was strange, they had this idea of not working on the seventh day. A very odd thing to do. Um, and, and they worshipped one God. A bit strange. They had funny things about not eating certain food. Uh, they're really strange. Um, and what's more, when they're with each other, they speak a different language. And anyone who's not of your race and speaks a different language, and has strange habits, you must know is bad. That's where we get racism from, and that's why multiculturalism is so important to us. But Jews had a struggle with that, but they also had to resist um, the attempts of the cultures around them to just, uh, you know, homogenize them. And uh, some of the key points where they demarcated themselves from the wider world were idolatry, obviously, and same-sex relations was another area. So this was a favorite one that they would pick up and say, those cultures uh, engage in same-sex relations. We don't do that. So it was a, um, it was a clear uh, distinction, and they played on that. Um, that's part of the immorality and the evil of the pagan world. So you've got that, in a sense, already back in Leviticus, where it's talking about a different set of cultures. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I'm bringing you. 
And that then introduces a whole lot of rules about sex and marriage and incest and all kinds of things. You're not to do that. Um, when I'm describing it like that, I, I'm not meaning that to be negative. I think it's really important that we learn how to demarcate. We learn how to resist what the wider culture might want us to do. And they certainly had to do that. But this was an issue. Aristius, who was writing in the late 2nd century BCE, um, refers to male prostitution, which was rife, um, and uh, refers to the danger of depopulation if people engage in same-sex relations. Pseudo Thucydides, who was late 1st century BCE, is also against both male same-sex relations and female same-sex relations. Um, actually, He's got um, uh, deals with the Ten Commandments and tucks it in under adultery, uh, like it's that's the heading that you put sexual immorality under and includes it at that point, and warns parents of male sexual predators um, with the advice: don't you know when you when your boy's twelve and he's got long hair, don't platter, don't make him look attractive because there are sexual predators around. Um, so that kind of advice has been given in that writing. And he also cites the animal argument, you shouldn't be doing this because the animals don't do it. Um, I've mentioned that before. The Sibylline oracles, which are from the second century BCE, um, uh, attacking Rome, uh, talk about male prostitution, uh, adulteries and illicit intercourse with boys, as an effeminate and unjust evil city, they describe the city of Rome, and as unclean. Um, you see the same kind of values being expressed here. Second Enoch, which is early uh, first century CE, talks about the sin which is against nature. It's the same argument. Um, it's unnatural, which is child corruption in the anus in the manner of Sodom. So um, though Sodom's actually male rape, Sodom came to be used, we've come to use the word sodomy, um, as uh, anal intercourse of a male with a male. Um, and uh, that's referred to here in this passage. Sowing worthless seed, and the, the argument there is the semen is being wasted, um, including abominable fornications, that is, friend with friend in the anus, and every other kind of wicked uncleanness which it is disgusting to report. So this is not just forced, uh, it's not just pederasty, it's also attacking um, uh, mutual consensual same-sex relations. Um, and that's consistent with what you have in other Jewish writings as well. Uh, the Apocalypse of Abraham is interesting because it, it talks about m naked men standing forehead to forehead. I'm quite sure what they're doing. Uh, but uh, obviously it, it's not right, um, according to this author. The Book of Wisdom, uh, which we've got in the Apocrypha, also uses an argument that people when they pervert their understanding of God into idolatry, so they don't recognize God as God, that has as a result that they get a perverted understanding of themselves, which reflects in perverted sexual activity. So the argument there is like Paul's argument in Romans, that one perversion leads to another. Um, and you've got that already in the Book of Wisdom, uh, that seems to lie in behind uh, what Paul is saying to some degree. And then, finally, uh, the book called Joseph and Asenet, which is a first century, um, really, novel. It's, it's kind of a romance. Uh, it tells the story of Joseph, Joseph who went down to Egypt, who married Asenet, who was an Egyptian, a highly controversial thing to do. Um, but it idealizes Asenet and says no one, not even her virgin attendants, ever sat on her bed. So, well, if you're in the first century, that ticks a box. It says so, um, 
So she wasn't engaged in same-sex relations with her attendants. She wasn't lesbian. Um, that's quite possibly how they would have read that. Josephus uh, talks about... Um, now, Josephus is writing at the end of the first century. He also wrote a number of things, like uh, Philo, and he talks about same-sex behaviour as resulting from excess. Um, people getting carried away with their passions, losing control of them, men going in all kinds of directions promiscuously with women and with men. And uh, he gives us the illustration of Antony that I just told you about a short time ago. Now, let's stop. Have a conversation with the people around you on the table and uh, just talk about anything that comes up for you as a result of what we've been talking about. We'll then have some moments for any further questions before we go on to look at the New Testament. Um, it's been good to be able to wander around and uh, uh, I've responded to some questions, but there may be some plenary questions as well um, at this point before we move into the New Testament. No, there are not. So we'll go into the New Testament. Yeah. No, there wasn't an extreme problem there. No, uh, the question was about whether there was population imbalance. I mean, in some places there would be, of course. Um, but uh, because of slaughters and wars and so forth. Okay, New Testament. Um, causing little ones to stumble, it would be better to have a millstone around your neck and to be cast into the depths of the sea. My gosh, what's that about? I mean, that's extreme. Well, you see, what it's about, uh, causing little ones to stumble, we often don't read sexually, but um, the word that's used there, which is actually scandalizo, scandalon, that we get our word scandal from it, which often has sexual connotations it doesn't need to have, but it was a word used in a sexual, con in a sexual context. And if you ask people in the ancient world, what could you do that would be abusive of a child, you ask Jews that, you would almost certainly at the top of the list get pederasty. You would get um, uh, sexual exploitation of children because it was very widespread. So while we cannot know this for sure, I think it's highly likely that the saying is related to that, or at least in part to that, um, uh, causing one of these little ones to stumble um, that's to say, leading them into sexual, through sexual exploitation, leading them into trouble like that. Um, the tradition attributes to Jesus some very strict sayings about sexuality, including, if your hand or eye or foot causes you to stumble again, and it's in a, Matthew puts it directly into a sexual context, cut it off, pull it out, get rid of it. In other words, take your sexuality very seriously because it can be a form of abuse. It's also, of course, a form of intimacy. Now, um, there's another episode which um, can be heard in a sexual way, and I don't think it was meant this way, but the problem is that the word to touch Haptomai is the word to fondle and to have sexual intercourse or have sexual relations with. And it would have been possible to hear one of my favorite stories and one of yours, and I hate to do this, this will spoil it for you, um, is that mums and dads brought their children and, and the word that's used in Greek is a word that can mean a 12-year-old that age. Like the, the girl who was 12 who died, was the same word is used for her. Um, brought them to the teacher so that the teacher could haptomai, 
touch, fondle, have sexual enjoyment from would be how some people would have read it. And of course, if you read it that way, when you hear the disciples go mad and send the people away, it would make some sense. Now, I don't think there is evidence to suggest that in Jesus' context, Jewish families would do that. So I don't think that's the meaning of the passage. But um, it's really interesting that uh, it could be heard that way. We don't have any evidence that it was. So I'm mentioning that just to say, well, it's, it's possibly there, um, but um, uh, I don't think it's its original meaning. So go back to what you thought it was. Uh, there's reference to eunuchs from birth, um, and some people said, oh, that's gay people, but uh, I don't think that's really what the passage in Matthew is talking about. But you do have mention in 1 Corinthians in a list of people who won't get into heaven, into the kingdom of God, asenakoitai and malakoi, the two Greek words. Um, the first word's a, a word that is kind of made up, uh, all words are made up in a sense, but it's made up of two parts. Um, arsen is male, and koitai is bed, and these are male bedders, and probably it refers to the male active partner in a same-sex relationship. Not everybody agrees with that, but I think it's likely. It's also used in that sense in 1 Timothy 1.10. Malachi uh, is a word that means soft. It's not the technical term of a <laughs> passive partner in a same-sex relation, but it is the term for effeminate men, and they would fall into that category. So softies. Um, and uh, it, it's likely, though in some, you know, in historical reconstruction, we have to deal with degrees of probability. This is fairly a long way along the probability end of the spectrum, but we can't be certain. It's likely that these two words refer to the active and passive partners in same-sex relations. Uh, and it's with disapproval. Sodom gets referred to uh, in the New Testament as well as in Judaism. Frequently, um, the focus is not the sex, but the inhospitality. But um, uh, certainly there is violent same-sex behavior in the Sodom story. And one of the ways in the ancient world in which you humiliated and subdued a, conquest, a conquered people is that you raped the women and the men. Uh, and it belongs to that kind of thing, and alas, it still happens. Uh, and that's what the Sodom story is kind of about. Now, I'm going to move to Romans. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on Romans and looking at this carefully, um, because it's really for us the key text. Um, and, and Paul's argument in Romans 1 through to Romans 3 is that all people need God's saving righteousness, God's goodness, because all have sinned and deserve God's wrath or punishment. And to argue this, Paul starts with the obvious. Um, and we'll reflect on that. So if you look at how he begins, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who has faith to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as is it written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. And at the end of this section, uh, in chapter 3, you've got almost the same words, but now, irrespective of the law, the righteousness, righteousness, uh, goodness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, for all who believe. So Paul's mounting that argument, and he begins with the obviously apparent, uh, which he and his hearers would agree with, and that is same-sex intercourse. So Paul's, Paul's not trying to argue that same-sex intercourse is wrong. Everybody knows it is. And so he's finding common ground, so that he can go beyond that and say, well, yeah, okay, that's true, but you've also sinned. So that's how the argument works. So this is common ground, what they would have expected, what they would have believed. And so he starts 
on common ground and chooses to refer to same-sex relations because it wasn't controversial. Um, now, there are scholars who interpret this passage in Romans in ways that are different from the way I would interpret it. William Countryman um, says that what Paul is rejecting is the use of same-sex intercourse as a marker, something to demarcate Jews from others, like circumcision and the food laws. And uh, so really what Paul is doing is saying, you know, um, like circumcision and like food laws, same-sex relations is what has separated us Jews from non-Jews, but now in Christ we drop all those things. So same-sex relations are okay. Um, but Paul, when he's referring to same-sex relations in chapter 1, doesn't seem to be mentioning it as an example he's going to dismiss. He seems to be taking it very seriously as perversion and builds it into an argument that a perverted understanding of God leads to a per perverted understanding of oneself and one's sexuality. So that really doesn't work. Dale Martin, from the other, or also from a more gay end of things, suggests that Paul, in any case, rejects all sexual passion. So we don't really need to take Paul seriously in that sense, but this scarcely does justice to Paul's comments elsewhere. Paul doesn't reject all sexual passion. He just says it belongs in certain places, and it's out of place in others. Uh, John Boswell and Walter Wink, um, Paul is not actually uh, disapproving of homosexuals, he's only disapproving of heterosexuals. Um, but Paul, like Philo, would have rejected such distinctions. So that doesn't really work either. Robin Scroggs says, well, Paul's really only objecting to pederasty, that's to say, uh, sex with a junior, with a child. Um, but uh, 1 27 talks about mutual passion and suggests that Paul is actually targeting not only pederasty, but also consenting adults. Nor is it just about male prostitutes, nor just about cult prostitutes, these are other suggestions, because Paul's argument is that there's a problem in both the act and in the attitude, the psychology, of people who are same-sex oriented. Uh, and he argues that. Diane Swancup suggests that the charge of hypocrisy in chapter 2, verse 1, targets some Roman Stoics' relations with students. Um, that's possible, but it's not the main focus. Paul's main focus is all humanity, including Jews. Robert Gagnon, more from the conservative side, suggests that Paul does accept the homosexual, heterosexual distinction and targets not the orientation but the act. So Paul's not saying that people who are same-sex oriented, they're sinners. They only become sinners if they act it out. Uh, in fact, Paul would not have accepted the distinction between homosexual and heterosexual. And it's clear in Romans 1 that Paul targets both the act and the attitude. Um, so that doesn't really work either. David Fredrickson suggests that Paul argues for male shame, and uh, this is an argument that Paul does use, how this is shaming for a man, um, but if so, he sees both the active and passive partners engaged in shame, because for Paul it's shaming to be a passive partner like a woman, but it's shaming to be an active partner who makes the passive partner act like a woman. Um, so it's part of acting contrary to divinely created order and what you've got in Romans is allusions to Genesis 1.27. In fact, you use the word male and female, which the NRSV and other translations translate as man and woman, and therefore we lose the connection with Genesis 1. But in the Greek it's quite clear. Um, they are acting contrary to the divinely created order and command um, and that included his assumptions about how that order should be, uh, which we deem cultural. Paul had an understanding of God's order, and to act contrary to God's order um, is 
obviously sin. Now Paul sometimes extends that to include things like what women should wear, namely that as, they, as women should be veiled in daily life, and we see this in Islam, but we no longer do it, they should remain veiled, their head covered, married, married women, when they're in worship. This is the old hats and church thing. And Paul sees that as part of the divine order. That's a cultural assumption that he makes. Um, but it stands beside other assumptions he makes, um, which are well rooted in the biblical text, namely that there is only male and there's only female. So anyone acting contrary to that is acting contrary to nature. So let's look at the text. Romans 1.24. There's only four verses. We're going to look at four verses. That's all. Um, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, says Paul. The therefore um, is explaining something. Uh, it's actually ex it, it's explaining what went before, but the explanation gets repeated in the following verse, which summarizes uh, 1, 19 to 23, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. In other words, um, they got God wrong, so they got themselves wrong. And so God gave them up to uh, follow the consequences of getting themselves wrong. As in the Book of Wisdom that we referred to, and also some other parts of Paul's writings, the argument is that a perverted understanding of God denying God's true nature results in a perverted understanding of oneself denying one's true nature as male and female. So he's not arguing that you know people are gay because of the fall or, or limiting the attention in any way. He's saying uh, this is something that happens when people get God wrong. Perverted understanding of God leads to a perverted understanding of themselves. And it's interesting in this passage, Paul uses a number of uh, compounds from the word to exchange, change, or pervert, which is the loaded word that's sometimes used. Um, and I've just listed them here. They exchange the glory of the mortal God. They exchange the truth about God. They exchange natural intercourse for unnatural intercourse. Perverted understanding of God leads to a perverted understanding of themselves. And it's interesting in this passage, Paul uses a number of uh, compounds from the word to exchange, change, or which is the loaded word that's sometimes used. Um, and I've just listed them here. They exchange the glory of the mortal God. They exchange the truth about God. They exchange natural intercourse for unnatural intercourse. So Paul's argument is that these people have perverted, changed something as they have perverted, changed the true understanding of God. So God gave them up, that's to say, abandoned them to their sexual perversions, including with a view to their suffering the consequences, in that sense, an expression of God's anger. And this is not an excuse, can't help themselves having such a mind with dishonorable desires and passions, but as in 120, it's without excuse. Um, in 124 and 26 to 28, both their psychological state and their actions are deemed blameworthy. Um, this is quite clear when you look at the text in Paul. Still with this verse, um, in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, literally in the desires of their hearts or their minds, degrading passions um, uh, into passions of dishonor, uh, consumed with passion, burning with passion, they burned in passion for one another. Um, these passions, as misdirected to their own sex and as excessive, in Paul's view, are not a natural orientation to be tolerated as God created passions, but a perversion to be condemned. And that's the argument that Paul has, and, and he would expect people to agree with him on that. These are wrong. Wrongly directed 
and excessive passions and to be condemned, whether they result in acts or not. Like Philo, um, thinking of drunken parties with indiscriminate sex, maybe, but I think it's, uh, for Paul, it's a bit more psychological than that. Still on Romans 1.24, the degrading, dishonouring of their bodies among themselves, um, dishonouring, that's behaviour reducing the passive partner to the level of a woman, contrary both to society's norms and to creation. Among themselves, literally for one another, indicates that this is mutual and brings shame also on the active partner whose action brings shame to the other. This is, uh, this is sort of... This is mutual, uh, consensual sex that's being attacked here. Romans 1.26 goes on to say, For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women, literally females, and that's the echo of Genesis 1.27, exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. Exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. Now, some have said the unnatural intercourse is bestiality, women sleeping with dogs, uh, or it's anal sex, which was practiced more in the ancient world and up until recent centuries when you didn't have contraception, at least you had anal intercourse. And that is, you know, um, oral sex in its various forms. Uh, it's possible that that's what's being referred to, but it's much more likely that it refers to unnatural sex because it's sex between women. Um, natural intercourse is sex between men. Um, or sex, sorry. No, no. <laughs> natural intercourse for a woman is sex with a man. Um, unnatural is women having sexual intercourse with women, according to Paul. And Paul continues with corresponding male behaviour introducing it with the word homoios in Greek, which means in the same way. Also, males giving up natural intercourse with the female, as God had set it up, were consumed with passion for one another. The mutuality thing again. Males committed shameless acts with males and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Natural intercourse is what is natural for men and women, which is sex with the person of the opposite sex. Male and female is an allusion to Genesis 1. Literally, it says um, males in males. Uh, might be meant quite literally, uh, in which case it would be referring to anal intercourse. Shameless acts. We've met the word shame earlier, dishonouring uh, their bodies, passions of dishonour. The due penalty, uh, it's been difficult to work out. So if men do this, wh what's the penalty? Well, um, there's various theories, and one which is uh, more recent and may well be true is penis and anal soreness. I don't have any experience of this, but um, this is credible. Um, uh, Feminisation is another one. Uh, to be made like a woman is a terrible thing. Uh, a waste of money and time, is that the penalty? Addiction, sexual addiction, lack of fulfilment, um, we don't quite know. I'm inclined to think that it may be straight physical in Paul's view. So since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, so in these four verses Paul sums up his argument, God gave them up to an unfit mind. It's a play on words, a fit, an unfit and to things that should not be done. The focus isn't just acts. Uh, Paul's focus is always sin, not just sins, but a debased mind, the perverted orientation of passions. The psychological focus was already in the primary failure to acknowledge God. They became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. So there's a psychological argument here as well. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, and it goes on to list them all, which I won't read. Um, they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, yet they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. 
the death penalty may be an allusion to the death penalty for same-sex intercourse in Leviticus 20 um, because it doesn't apply to a lot of the other things in the list. Paul is not making same-sex intercourse the pinnacle of all evil, as though he's chosen the absolute worst example he could possibly think of, but he is employing it as an instance to further his argument that all have sinned. Uh, we might want to put the greed of the wealthy up there or some other more far-reaching evil, but he wants to start with something that they'd all agree on. And then he'll go on to say, but you've got to be aware that you've sinned too, in other ways. So you all sinned, so you all need God's forgiveness. Um, the temptation to modernize Paul, either by explaining away his comments as applicable to only special instances, or by transforming his comments on desires into a kind of neutral pathology, he's not condemning the passions, or natural sexual orientation, is to be resisted. I think it's better for us to hear with all integrity what Paul is saying and not to try to explain it away. Paul almost certainly believed that all men were heterosexual and women and that accordingly attitudes and behaviours which moved away from what God made males and females to be and do were manifestations of gross sin. And Paul assumed his readers, his hearers, would totally agree with him. We will go on to ask about what do we do with this, but before we do, let me ask, are there any questions about this key passage and its understanding? Yep. I think this has no validity. Um, there are a number of things, a, a number of attempts to make, somehow make it fit, you know. So Paul was gay and it was kind of all right. The passage being referred to is not about gay relations um, and the being dead is not about being gay. Um, so I don't think there's any credibility in that. Well, Spong's not an exegete. His has some good theological points, but he's not a historian. Okay. So, what are we to say today? Um, and this is an important question. Paul, as I've said, almost certainly believed that all men and women were heterosexual and accordingly attitudes and behaviours which moved away from what God made males and females to be and do were manifestations of gross sin and he assumed his hearers would totally agree with him. And I think he's right. Like if, if gay people, people engaged in same-sex relations, are actually heterosexual people who have deliberately perverted their sexuality to generate same-sex passions and to act them out, I think Paul's argument's valid. It's a good argument. Um, and we need to respect that that's why Paul reached that conclusion. But it's qu uh, quite another question whether we view those common Jewish assumptions of those days, Paul's and those of other Jews, as sufficient to account for what we observe as the phenomenon of people having sexual orientation towards uh, those of their own sex today. Uh, and this is a really important question. Is Paul's assumption right that all gay people are actually people who have perverted their sexuality? Um, he could be right. I mean, I don't think he is, but it's understandable he would draw that conclusion. That's what other Jews of the time uh, believed. Uh, so we have to say, are there any reasons why we might not believe that? In some instances, his assessment will be directly applicable 
Deliberate perversion, not least in the context of extravagance and abuse of alcohol, has its contemporary equivalents today and should with Paul be seen for what it is. I don't think we need to resile from that. Um, there's an awful lot of abuse, uh, promiscuous abuse, uh, that goes on, and we ought to name it for what it is. We, you know, we not necessarily judgmentally, but we we need to see what is evil and exploitive, and acknowledge it. But there is an increasing acceptance uh, of the view that for others who are same sex in their orientation, um, we are not dealing with such perversion but with what close, comes close to being their natural state. Um, and, and this is a problem. I mean, for some people it's not a problem, but it is a pro it's a problem if you then are saying, so what do I do with the scriptural material? Do I just ditch it? How do I relate? Uh, and uh, uh, it's gone very quickly in the wider society. Uh, the High Court this week... Uh, declared that there's male and female and other. Like, uh, it's now widely accepted in our society. It doesn't mean it's right. It's widely accepted in our society that there are genuinely same-sex-oriented people. Whether permanently or short-term or whatever, they do exist and people's genitalia are sometimes a bit mixed up and people's internal orientation is sometimes mixed up. So... Whatever we do in our handling of scripture, we need to respect what scripture says and respect what we know and find a way through this without getting ourselves tied in a knot. I said I would outline three responses that kind of summarize um, responses that there are today. One is to embrace Paul's view that same-sex mind, orientation, desire and action is a sinful perversion comparable to idolatry. So you can actually argue you can argue that Paul was actually right and all this other stuff that people say about you know these people are natural is all just part of um, um, the, the culture of the time trying to modernize us. Um, if that's the case, if that's the stance you take, then one should require such people in a spirit of love and compassion not to express their sexuality but to seek healing and offer them forgiveness. And there are movements that do this, that totally agree with Paul and, and the danger is that if we don't agree with those people we'll sort of say, oh, they're bigots. They're not bigots. There are really caring Christians who take this stance and who, who offer therapy and forgiveness um, to people who are like this. Gay marriage, of course, must be rejected on this basis because it would be to institutionalize a pathology. It's not something one would want to do, and leadership in the church would be acceptable only when such people embrace celibacy while they're on the road to recovery, getting back to being heterosexual, and uh, well on the way to healing. Now, people who choose this option can do so out of deep compassion for the people concerned and, as I've said, should not be labelled as uncaring or intolerant. They're usually people for whose faith the authority of Scripture and its commands is foundational and many of them prefer, but many of them prefer a modified approach, which I'll go on to, but uh, this is usually driven, this, this particular response is driven by an approach that says my loyalty to the Bible and what it says is the first priority. The rest might be messy, but I'm going to stick with that. Um, and it's a defensible position. It's not a def position that I want to defend, but we need to understand that people who go this way are not stupid and bigots. Some of them are. There are bigots all over the place for all sorts of directions, but it can be a genuinely held position. Most people, most conservative evangelicals, for instance, don't take this line. Um, they go for a modified approach, which reads something like this. 
You embrace Paul's view that same-sex acts are sin, as Leviticus states, but not his view of sexual orientation. Um, that same-sex passion is perversion. So acknowledging, therefore, that there are some genuinely same-sex oriented people. And most who take a conservative evangelical uh, stance on that, which, you, I mean, I shouldn't really use that term in a way because uh, there are conservative evangelical people who are very pro-gay and there are those who are not. But um, this point of view is one which also seeks to adhere to scripture but can't deny that, um, you know, um, we've got high court judges, we've got um, Penny Wong, we've got... There are, and especially through personal experience, there are people who are genuinely same-sex oriented and were from their childhood. I've got colleagues who were conservative and, and, and one of them had a boy who was this way right from the beginning. A and he was, you know, he had to come to terms with the fact that this is the way it is for some people. For others it will be not permanently like that. Uh, they'll be like this for some years and then it may change. But once you say there are genuinely gay people, you have departed from Paul, Paul's presupposition. Like you've shared his condemnation that's in Leviticus 18, such acts are an abomination. But you don't agree anymore with his position on uh, whether there are genuinely gay people as well as perverts. Um, this is Robert Gagnon's position, um, one of the famous people who argues for this point of view. But, you see, if you take this, then this stance would say, nevertheless, these people should be celibate. Like, it's okay, don't feel guilty about being same-sex in your orientation. I mean, that's the way you are. It may be because of the fall, you know, it may be because of the mammal kingdom. You know, it's, it's there all over the place. Um, it may be because of some deep-seated psychological thing, and it may be that you can be healed from it, but it may be that you can't. So what do you do in the meantime? You remain celibate. Um, because same-sex acts are forbidden. So you see, this respects the scriptural prohibition. It doesn't ditch it. Gay marriage would be, of course, to institutionalise a pathology still, so you don't support that. Leadership in the church is acceptable, but only when these people are not acting out. It's okay for them to have that orientation, but they shouldn't act it out. Um, people who choose this option can do so, like the others, out of deep compassion for the people concerned. And again, they should not be labelled uncaring or intolerant. And they do so on the basis of their approach to scripture. You have legitimate desire, but you may never express it. It imposes celibacy. Um, sorry, imposed celibacy, of course, is a problem that many people taking this stance recognise because it's not altogether healthy. As more recent um, experiences with celibate priests have shown, uh, it's potentially dangerous. But it needn't be, you see. It needn't be. And people taking this stance would say, well, you know, I've talked with some, well, yes, I can see what you're saying, that celibacy is actually unhealthy um, for, for people, but, you know, the grace of God is there to help people. We will support them in love as they remain celibate. And um, you can say it's unfair to ask this of them, that they mustn't express their sexuality, but uh, God's goodness is there to help them through life and this is just one of the trials they need to cope with. Now, that's a defensible position um, and I want to give it its value because it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's a very strong position by a minority in the Uniting Church um, and we need to see that. It's not a stupid position. And its value is that it does uphold scripture, at least the prohibition. It doesn't uphold Paul's view. So it's, it's kind of a yes and no relationship to scripture. But yes and no relationships to scripture are all over the place. 
You know, we, 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 we remarry divorced people. That's forbidden by Jesus. Um, we, we, you know, we believe the world is round, not flat, as they would have believed. Um, there's all sorts of things in which we don't believe that marriages must end if there's been adultery, but that's what the biblical writers believe. So we do, to that degree, responsibly pick and choose, and this would be a stance that says, well, as with women speaking in church, we, we say, well, you know, we uphold the prohibition, but um, we don't think we're bound to Paul's view that same-sex people are necessarily perverted. The third position is not to embrace Paul's view of sexual orientation, acknowledging that there are some genuinely same-sex oriented people. That's the same as option two. Um, and then, and this is the tricky one, to say we encourage them to express their sexuality responsibly on the same basis as heterosexual people. You see, if you take this stance, you're actually saying it's okay for you to express your sexuality, whatever that might mean in a same-sex relationship. If you say that, then you are, you are actually distancing from the prohibition in Leviticus, and you need to see that. That might be too big a cost, and so you may want to go back to option two. Then they should be treated in the same way as heterosexual people with regard to marriage and leadership in the church. Now you can argue that um, from this point of view you would argue uh, anything other than that is discriminatory. And then you could feed in a whole lot of things about how people have suffered because of that discrimination. In accordance with the, that they should be treated in accordance with the biblical values of justice, compassion and non-discrimination. People who choose this option can do so out of deep compassion for the people concerned and similarly should not be labelled unbiblical, wishy-washy or just conforming to current trends. So if you're a person who takes the more the, the, the option two, um, you'll know that there are those who say anyone taking option three, this, this particular point of view, they're really just liberals, they're just wishy-washy, they don't have any respect for scripture. Um, you can't really, I mean that may be true of some, but you can't really do it. Um, we need to respect people's different points of view. Um, they take a more differentiated approach to scripture. Now, I, I don't hide the fact that this is my choice, um, but I want to respect the fact that your choice might be one or two uh, or three. Considering the options, um, uh, being in harmony with Paul, genuinely accepting his assumptions and conclusions about act and orientation, or, and this is what people like um, uh, Gagnon do, denying he really means it by saying he condemns acts only in certain contexts or only in pederasty, or that's not quite what Gagnon is saying, others say that, or denying he condemns desires and orientation. Um, well, I, I think it's not helpful to do that. Option one has a lot of integrity. You uphold scripture, full stop, and you cope with the messy rest. Engaging with Paul critically, accepting his conclusion based on his assumptions, uh, but denying these assumptions are valid universally, and so approaching the situations where they are not with new perspectives. Uh, we embrace different assumptions from biblical writers on cosmogony, how the world came to be, don't let people tell you that Genesis says, you know, creation occurred millions of years ago. It doesn't. That's not how people at the time of Jesus understood it, nor how the writers understood it. Creation took place 6,000 years ago. It's not difficult to do the arithmetic when you go back. Now, we don't, most of us, even those of us who are very conservative, we don't believe that. What we often do is we say, oh, it never meant that. That's a lie. That's, that's, that's deceit. That's telling lies. Um, it did mean that. Um, so we do, you know, we don't share a lot of the biblical points of view on cosmo cosmogony, on cosmology. Our world is round. The sun doesn't go around the earth. We, well, there's a whole lot of things there. Medicine, we've got different assumptions. 
demonology, we see things differently, we explain psychiatric disorders differently. We don't believe the world's about to end as they did, Paul in his own lifetime. Um, our notions of reproduction are different. Uh, the notion that, uh, you know, uh, the woman is like a seedbed and the man puts the seed, the egg, in the woman. That was their view, a, a, a very dominant view. Uh, we have the egg already in the woman and we have it fertilised by the man. Um, or the other major view was that the woman's got semen as well, that white stuff, and uh, so the man's got semen. They both mix together. It depends how much there is from the man or the woman whether the baby's going to be a boy or a girl. Uh, you know, our understanding, of course, has changed, and that's not any disrespect to the ancient world. Our understanding of marriage and divorce has changed. Um, as I said, for us, um, adultery no longer mandates divorce. It did in the ancient world. You had to divorce. Um, our attitude towards slaves and women and many other things. So we do embrace different assumptions uh, while at the same time embracing the core of scripture. Are there valid grounds for doing so? That's to say not embracing these assumptions on sexual orientation. Uh, this is actually at the core of the different approaches today. Are there valid grounds for distancing ourselves on this issue from what the biblical writers say? Let's not deceive ourselves and try to make the biblical writers say what we, what we believe. If we are saying we're going to distance, we need to come to terms with the pain, controversy of distancing ourselves. Now I'm convinced, and this is my personal statement, that for some with same-sex orientation, we're not dealing with perversion, but with what comes close to being their natural state. Not everyone will agree with me on that. For them, rather than unbiblically accepting their orientation or sympathetically treating it as a consequence of the fall and then, I think, cruelly, however unintentionally, imposing the biblical prohibition on expressing their sexuality, I would urge that they treat themselves as seriously and respectfully as should all, whatever their orientation, so that their sexuality is healthily integrated and expressed in loving and caring relationships. Now, not everyone will see it that way. Such accountability and opportunity should apply also to their possibility of marriage and of leadership in the church. I mean, that's the stance that I would take, but I can see why others would not see it that way. There is wise precedent for applying the biblical principle of love and care in relation to biblical commands and the assumptions of biblical writers which are no longer seen as valid, applicable or sufficiently comprehensive. Like Jesus prioritised love over other requirements. It is about what takes priority. The Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. The early church set circumcision and food laws aside, though they were commanded in scripture, unquestionably so. Um, and of course that caused great controversy because there were Christians who said, you cannot set aside what the Bible commands. And the Bible commands circumcision. And most of the early Christians said, but we've got a deeper understanding of scripture and we, we're not going to impose those. And those who are strict fundamentalists really say, this is outrageous. You know, you're watering down the gospel. You're not believing the Bible. And people like Paul said, yes, we are, but we're taking a different stance to it. So some of the tensions that we experience today were way back then. The later church had changing assumptions and norms about slaves, women, including in leadership, Forbidding divorce, remarriage, adultery is requiring divorce and you know we've made changes on all of those. Respecting biblical writers includes acknowledging distance as well as embracing proximity. This applies also to what is said about same-sex relations. So the discussion is ongoing. Um, and you know, you, you will know people and, and maybe yourselves, you know, you, you will take different stances. My aim has been to show at least the historical biblical background and then to say, well, let's understand why people take the stance as they do. Um, 
But let me open myself to any questions or comments at this stage. Um, anyone like to make a comment or uh, yes? Yeah, this is a really tricky question. When, yeah, how do you judge uh, when a person is genuinely gay or not? Um, a and when, uh, at the uh, last year at the Society for Biblical Literature conference in the U.S., they had a session on my that chapter of my book, um, and this was one of the questions that came up: Does this now mean? When you talk about genuinely same sex, is that we now we've now got a little bit of an experiment going on where we go around and say, is he genuinely, is she genuinely gay? What's the measure? I think we can't be doing that. We need to leave that to people to decide in their own integrity before God. Uh, many of the people around us will know. Mostly, it's not too controversial. I mean. Um, you can see some people acting up and playing up. You can see some people who are just going through a phase. You know, um, it's really unhelpful when they're going through a teenage phase of having a crush on another girl um, to say, oh, you must be lesbian permanently. No, no, you're just going through a phase. So, you know, there are sensitivities here. So this, we're really talking about people who experience themselves as genuinely oriented in that way. Many of them uh, will act because of, if they're connected with the church, many of them will have suffered hell. And they will have gone to therapy, they will have tried to reverse it, and, and then they come to the conclusion, this is actually the way I am. So the question you're raising is a really important one. The danger in it, and it was pointed out to me, because I was saying similar things, is don't for goodness sake now start a witch hunt about who's truly gay or not. Um, this, this is going to be different from instance to instance. I wonder if I should share a personal, let me share a personal story. When I was 16, um, I, I'm not gay, by the way. I wouldn't have a problem if I were, but I, I'm not. Um, but when I was 16, I had a crush on a boy. Now, okay, you can explain it psychologically because I was in a very conservative theological background uh, in which sex was problematic anyway, heterosexual or homosexual. Um, but I had no idea that this was anything to do with same-sex or homosexuality. I just had a crush on this boy. I love this boy. My first love poem was actually written to him. I love Ross. It was an acrostic down on the left-hand side. <laughs> I think I still have it. Um, a and uh, I think I touched his hand once, you know, like there was a desire for some kind of physical contact. That's about as far as it went. Like it, it disappeared as I, as I went through my teenage years. But it wouldn't have been helpful for me if you'd come along with your bandwagon and found me and said, oh, Bill Loder, you're gay forever. That would really not have been helpful. So we need to be sensitive to the fact that people will go through phases and stages. But we don't need to be the judges from outside. We need to help them to sense what's going on in them. And for some people, it will be that I realize what's going on in me is something that actually needs serious therapy and it can be changed. But I also need to know that sometimes uh, this is just the way I am. And my mum and dad have said, I've always been like this. And that's okay. Yeah, does that help? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a... Uh, marriage was taboo at one stage. We, you know, we were not prepared to talk about violence in marriage, and we are now. Um, and, uh, I mean, we recognise abuse and violence wherever it happens. I mean, we are acknowledging that. 
why the first century would have treated children differently, they really didn't have the kind of focus on children that we have. You know, children were children were sort of almost chattels, although you mustn't exaggerate that. But we don't have we don't have in the surviving literature any discussions of uh, how children were orienting in terms of their sexuality. Sexuality was also something not talked about. You know, you didn't talk about it. And that's been with us until, um, you know, it's become fashionable. We're now more prepared to talk about it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, for me, um, a bisexual person needs to take responsibility for the way in which they express their sexuality. And they may be expressing it in more than one direction. And I, I, I think that needs to be responsible. Um, if you take option two, a person who is bisexual should um, cut off the, if it's a male, male to male part of that. And, uh, you know, let, let's be empathetic to the option two people. Um, you know, communities can be very supportive as people have to grapple with those things. And some of my friends would say, well, it's like people living with a disability. You know, you support them. I, I just, I think that's too harsh and unrealistic, but uh, it's a defensible position. Yep. Um, in theory, option two sounds like that is the two options. Yeah. Uh, in case you didn't hear the question, um, the, the option two, which suggests that people who are uh, who are same sex in their orientation should not express it. Um, uh, that's, um, you know, so they'll really never be able to express their sexuality except in what's for them an unnatural way in a heterosexual encounter. Um, that's, you know, you're saying that's unrealistic. Um, I mean, I think it's more than that. It's actually cruel. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you see, the counter to that is that... Um, uh, we believe that God helps us live with disabilities and this is a disability that's the result of the fall, they would argue. Uh, and um, God helps us live with all kinds of disabilities and this happens to be one of them. Uh, life is made up of more than um, having sex. Now, you know, m my choice is not to go with that argument, but that's the counter-argument. Yep. Um, what about the connection between, um well, yes, I mean, there are some people who, you know, would say we set aside the Old Testament laws and we follow only the New Testament. Um, the New Testament writers, uh, whether we like it or not, would have embraced the Old Testament laws. And uh, not to do so would be... Um, they would need some exceptional evidence, like Luke and Matthew both say not a stroke of the law, including Leviticus, is to be set aside. Not a stroke. Um, the exception is that God revealed to Peter, according to Acts, that it was okay um, to mix with Gentiles on more than one occasion, which were normally forbidden, and it's okay not to ask them to be circumcised. Now that's written up and acts as an exception. And the rule is you keep the old. Um, now New Testament writers are not the same on this. Paul, uh, uh, Mark says, well, on food laws, he says, well, the biblical laws about food, clean, unclean food, f food just goes into the stomach and out into the toilet. It's silly to say food makes you unclean. Now, that's all very well for us. We'll say, good on you, Mark, that's true. But it's culturally very insensitive, and it's actually setting aside parts of Scripture as making no sense. 
So Mark and Paul are at the more radical end of Christianity where they're prepared to set things aside. Um, the others are much more hesitant. We don't even know with Matthew whether he would still uphold circumcision. So, um, and as for the historical Jesus, the historical Jesus in none of the controversies, and he had lots of controversies, in none of them is there any indication that he set Old Testament laws aside. He prioritized, he said, healing, loving on the Sabbath is more important than keeping the Sabbath laws, but keeping the Sabbath laws is important. Um, so, um, and Jesus was identified with John the Baptist in um, that controversy which lost John the Baptist his head. What was the controversy about? It was about Antipas marrying the divorced wife of his stepbrother. In Australian law, you're allowed to do that. It's not a problem for us. But it was a problem, according to Leviticus, a very strict reading of it. And Jesus and John the Baptist were on the same page on that. Um, yeah, well, I, I would say what now is that we, I think our Australian law is correct. It would have been okay. We would say, I mean, those of us who are celebrants, it is okay to have someone marry the divorced wife of their stepbrother. There's nothing wrong with that. But you see, for John the Baptist there was, and he lost his head over it. So, you know, we, we need to be sensitive to this. And what is probably least comfortable if I say this, but we need to be honest, we do not have any indication that Jesus questioned those laws. In other words, we can assume that Jesus held to these laws just as he would have shared the view of his day that the world was more or less flat. Uh, we, you know, we've got to acknowledge that with integrity and not tell lies for our faith as though Jesus was actually going around with a... Um, an external hard disk in his pocket that gave him all the science that we have. And this is just not true. It's contrary to church doctrine. You know. Absolutely. So what we do, I think, is we do what we see the early church starting to do and saying relationships and love are the most important thing and that may lead you to set some things like circumcision, which was a barrier, food laws, which were a barrier, um, and other things aside. Um, their assumptions about women as inferior, after all, women were usually half the age of a man when they got married, so they were inferior well, in experience, but, you know, it wasn't difficult to, for men to go on and say, well, they must be inferior in nature. Uh, that's what the biblical writers assumed. That's why, apart from a few exceptional women, the rest should be quiet in church. You should not be having public discussions in church. You women, you should ask your husbands when you get home. Now, you can see where that comes from, but we reject that. So there's a whole lot of things that we, we reject, including slavery, um, so as bearers of the tradition, the biblical tradition, we have a creative challenge, and that is um, there's stuff in there that's irrelevant, there's stuff in there that's destructive, there's stuff in there that's life-giving, and our role is to discern the difference and make sure that in this is the word of the Lord for people. Yeah. We must be about to stop... Um, Where's our... Yeah, yeah. One, one last question. A two-part question. This is like a Q&A thing. Um, and the two parts have got an A, B, C in it with a subclause. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, the gay marriage debate is really quite interesting because the Catholic Church and other church people will often say marriage is for the bringing up of children, so there's got to be a male and a female. That makes sense. But since we've got effective contraception in the 1960s onwards, 
Um, many people get married not for the purpose of having children, and some at age where they can't. And we don't say those are illegitimate marriages. In the ancient world, there were two strands to marriage. One was marital intimacy, partnership. The other was reproduction. They were sort of bound together because they didn't have good contraception, so you couldn't really distinguish them. We can. And so many people get married just for intimacy. Most people still get married for both. Um, but what is the difference between two gay people coming together for intimacy who are not going to have children and two 60-year-olds coming together for intimacy who are not going to have children? Now, the second part of your question is important too, and that is, um, isn't it a good idea for a child to be brought up with a male and female? I think it is. Uh, but I know that there are lots of models of family, and if you're bringing up a child as a single parent, there's plenty of those marriages, uh, well, mar non-marriages, plenty of those families, um, then it's actually important to make sure your child has contact with an adult, good contact, positive contact with an adult of the other sex. Ditto, if you're bringing up, if you're two lesbians, um, like Jen Penny Wong and her partner, and you're bringing up children, it's really important to make sure those children have good contacts with somebody of the opposite sex. In other words, if it's not built in, you can do something about it. It's not an argument against it, necessarily. Some people would say it is. I don't think it is. With that, I think the family is ready to uh, break up, isn't it?